Okay, well, I'm going to just go ahead and get started. So if somebody could close the door, that would be great. And then we'll have a little bit less ambient noise in the room. Hello, everybody, and welcome, and thanks for being here. Um, on a uh, busy Sunday, there's a lot of competing events, so it's good that you're here with us. We appreciate it. Uh, I'm Bill Drake from Columbia Institute for Teleinformation at Columbia University in New York City. And this is the session on can digital economy agreements limit internet fragmentation. Um, at last year's IGF in 2022, I organized a day zero event on understanding internet fragmentation concepts and their implications for action where we tried to talk through some of the definitional issues that have uh, plagued the discussion of internet governance over the past decade in order to try to get some greater clarity and try to set up discussions about how we might move towards policy responses to some of the main challenges posed by fragmentation. Um, and I said at the time that this, this, that would be the first of two sessions that were linked. This is that uh, second session that's linked that's attempting to begin to look at policy responses um, using more innovative and interesting mechanisms uh, that have not necessarily been discussed a lot in the IGF context to date. Um, you know, there's been long running, for those of you who've been around internet governance discussions over the past uh, 25 years, you know that there's been long running discussions around the question of institutional innovation and how do we create new mechanisms to respond to new internet governance and digital policy challenges as they arise. And the discussions around that question have been often very divisive and tended to polarize around questions uh, like multi-stakeholder versus multilateral frameworks, or when, when to have hard law versus soft law kinds of responses, the relative merits of treaties versus guidelines, declarations, MOUs, other kinds of mechanisms, et cetera. And none of these have proven in, in recent years to be terribly helpful in responding to some of the issues that are most uh, directly relevant to fragmentation that people have been talking about a lot uh, in recent years around data flows, data localization, things like that. Um, so it's in that context then of the, the larger discussion of institutional fragmentation and the question of how do we respond to um, internet fragmentation uh, challenges um, that this uh, topic becomes interesting. We're gonna talk today about digital economy agreements. Digital economy agreements, or DEAs, are new kinds of approaches to international cooperation and policy convergence that have emerged alongside and been informed by the laborious and difficult digital trade negotiations of the past decade. The center of gravity on these DEAs has been mostly in the Asia Pacific region, uh, with Singapore being very centrally involved in many of them. The most widely discussed examples of DEA is the 2020 Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, or DEPA, between Chile, Singapore, and New Zealand, which Korea just joined, and Canada, China, and Peru are seeking to join. Um, and that will get uh, particular attention in this context. But there have been a, a variety of other DEAs formed as well, between Singapore, Australia, UK and Singapore, Korea and Singapore, and now the 10-member ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, has launched negotiations to try to come up with a DEA framework for the 10 countries. And the DEAs that have been reached ha have uh, tried to promote policy convergence on a broad range of digital issues from data flows, enforced data localizations to online customs duties, trade treatment of digital products, uh, source protection of source codes, EE -E invoicing and certificates, supply chains, digital identities, digital inclusion, uh, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, consumer protection, you name it. The whole the whole range of issues that are out there on the international agenda, many of them have been addressed in these DEAs, and many will be addressed in, in DEAs to come. Um, and what's interesting in particular about the DEAs is that they follow a modular architecture. That is to say, each set of issues that is uh, addressed in, under a DEA is treated on a kind of standalone basis within an overarching umbrella framework, which means that these different issues can be different issue streams can all be addressed in different ways. You can have different formulations of interests and uh, move faster or slower depending on how mature an issue is, et cetera. You can have variable commitments in terms of hard versus soft law kinds of commitments. You can try to institutionalize dialogue through a variety of different modalities that are uh, bespoke to the particular issues in question. 
you can use uh, this kind of architecture to be much more agile and adaptive to changing uh, environments because they're not, uh, the, the mo modules can be uh, uh, evolved separately in different ways. So there are very interesting kinds of approaches from an institutional standpoint to trying to figure out how do we establish ongoing institutionalized cooperation between countries around digital issues. And the uh, European Union has begun to do something similar. It's launched a series of what it calls digital partnerships and it's cut a series of these last year with Japan, Korea, Singapore, and is planning to do more. more. And these two follow this kind of like decentralized modular architecture where you have a range of different issues being addressed in different ways as part of an ongoing umbrella framework. And their uh, DPs have covered a wide range of issues, including 5G questions and quantum, everything else. So all of this has been interesting kind of institutional innovation that we thought is interesting in particular here in the IGF context because we've had an ongoing concern over the past years around internet fragmentation and some of what's been attempted through the DEAs and DPs is directly relevant to internet fragmentation. So we want to explore the question of how, to what extent are these new kinds of institutional arrangements interesting? Do they provide possible uh, avenues towards addressing fragmentation related issues in more creative ways that might overcome some of the barriers that have prevented effective cooperation between countries and so on. To do that, we have a very interesting panel. Now, I'm a little puzzled about how things are a little different here from previous. Uh, on the Zoom, do we have our two other, we have two remote speakers, but I'm not sure, are we gonna see them on the screen here? Uh, are, are you gonna be able to show the Zoom on here? so that the other speakers, all right, good. I see Stephanie and I see Rick, that's fantastic. So let me, uh, we have all our speakers, it's fantastic. So online we have uh, Stephanie Honey from the uh, APEC Business Advisory Council. Uh, Stephanie was formerly in the government in New Zealand and was a uh, WTO trade negotiator who was very directly involved in the DEPA negotiations and she's joining us uh, from New Zealand. Uh, different time zones, so welcome. Uh, we have Meiko Maguro here from the government of Japan. She's the director for international data strategy in the digital agency, and she's been centrally involved in the government's uh, data free flow with trust initiative in the G7 and other contexts. We have here to my left, the, my co-conspirator in this event, uh, Neha Mishra from uh, uh, the Graduate Institute in Geneva. She's a assistant prof professor of international economic law. Um, we have Ellie Nome, the founding director of the Columbia Institute for Teleinformation, where he's been for 40 years, and professor of economics, and Garrett Professor of Public Policy and Business Responsibility Emeritus at Columbia Business School in New York, uh, my colleague. Uh, online, we have, I hope, Chris Riley. Yes, okay, I can't, can't see in the little box. Chris Riley is a distinguished research fellow at the Annenberg Public Policy Center at the University of Pennsylvania in the US. Chris was, is also the executive director of the nonprofit Data Transfer Initiative, and he was previously at the US Department of State, where he worked with Hillary Clinton and others on digital freedom initiatives. Rick Sammons is online, joining us from Geneva, Switzerland. Rick is the director of the International Labor Organization's Research Department, and has been at Sherpa to the G20, the G7, and BRICS processes. Uh, previously, Rick was founder uh, uh, and chairman of the Climate Disclosure Standards Board, and the managing director of the World Economic Forum. Uh, so he's with us in Geneva. And we have Marta Soprano, a fellow in international political economy at the London School of Economics in the UK. So what we're gonna do is that each of the, the speakers will talk three to five minutes uh, to get started, uh, putting out some ideas relevant to the themes of this topic uh, about how they see the importance of uh, digital economy agreements as responses to the challenges that we have in terms of governance of the digital economy. Then we will have a little uh, interactive discussion around the policy questions that are listed on the uh, announcement for this event. And then uh, at the, when we get to the top of the hour, we have a half hour for open discussion among all participants when we very much hope that you will uh, choose to join in to the conversation. So that's the game plan. Um, so let's uh, start, Who would, which of you would like to start with uh, giving us some overview on digital economy agreements and their uh, relevance to fragmentation? 
Neha is the co-conspirator here. I think you could be the, the first victim. Okay, um, good, af good afternoon everyone uh, and a big thank you to the organizers. So what I'm going to do is to try to zoom out a bit uh, and look at digital economy agreements and digital partnerships from a global digital policy, digital law perspective and kind of tie in some of the ideas that uh, a lot of people here might be interested in from an internet governance, internet regulation perspective. Um, the larger point that I want to make uh, is that that because, and I think Bill already introduced the idea that these digital economy agreements and digital partnerships as a broader category offer several bright lines uh, for involving a lot of uh, people who are involved in internet policy making uh, because they defy a lot of traditional boundaries and architectural uh, features of traditional trade agreements. Uh, but at the same time, while I offer a lot of promising prospects, I think it's important for us to be cautious because these agreements have uh, been agreed upon by a limited number of like-minded countries and a lot of provisions in these agreements uh, and broadly in the partnership agreements uh, that are not necessarily like trade treaties uh, are soft disciplines, which means that there is political will necessary to take them further. So just in terms of characterizing, as I mentioned, they really challenge the traditional boundaries of trade law. And this is both in terms of scope uh, and in terms of the institutional mechanism. So Bill already outlined the kind of provisions included in these agreements, provisions on digital inclusion or data innovation or creating trust-based regulatory frameworks, um, creating different kinds of avenues for multi-stakeholder participation, uh, covering areas such as online safety, cybersecurity protection, techni technical standard setting, that's quite unusual. So if you look at e-commerce chapters and FTAs, you don't see such a broad range of issues. But also in terms of the procedures and mechanisms that are available, these agreements are quite unique because they provide many avenues for broad-based dialogues between, um, between different groups of stakeholders and not just governments and regulatory bodies. Um, there is a high focus on interoperability and trust-based solution making. And this, to me, as a trade lawyer, is fascinating because the vocabulary has completely changed from binding rules and dispute settlement and market access to how to build regulatory co cooperation and find trust-based solutions. Um, the other point I'll briefly point out is uh, we've spoken about a range of agreements, digital economy agreements, digital partnership, um, and they all have very different legal characteristics, but I think it's important to remember that the thrust of these agreements seem to be in the same direction, that they want to create more partnerships uh, which are based on uh, finding synergies in different areas of digital regulation. And they are also quite unusual because they only focus on the digital economy, unlike, unlike trade agreements where you could be uh, bargaining for automobiles in exchange of data flows, which doesn't make any sense, I know, from an internet governance perspective. So quickly then, for our discussion here at the IGF, I think I highlight a few possibilities uh, of synergies or at least exchange of ideas between this trade and internet world. Um, and one of them is, as I mentioned, because of these procedural or institutional mechanisms that are in place that allow for these dialogues. Uh, but also to keep in mind that these digital economy agreements cover a lot of areas that the internet multi-stakeholder community is really interested in. So this is also something, uh, areas such as net neutrality, data innovation, AI, uh, principles for data sharing, this is exactly what people at IGF, for instance, are interested in. I also want to briefly highlight that uh, across these digital economy agreements and the digital partnerships, uh, you will find language that supports the global open architecture of the internet, focuses on interconnectivity, and highlights its role in creating more opportunities for innovation and growth in the digital economy. Um, and I, uh, what is remarkable is, is that, and perhaps this might be in the long run, we'll see if it's a successful experiment, but definitely a few small open economies who have started negotiating this are making a clear statement that they would rather have common standards and common consensus and global norms rather than to have to side with specific digital powers and build on this narrative of, of digital sovereignty, which has also taken over the trade world. Um, I end by just drawing some points of caution here. We, while it's good to be optimistic, it's important to remember these are very new agreements. Uh, they have just started in the last couple of years, um, and they have 
so far been between countries which will be seen as like-minded open economies. Um, and while the softness, the flexibility, the modular structure is a blessing in many ways because it allows for these dialogues and trust-based mechanisms to develop, it is highly contingent on political will. So the real testing point might be when we see how countries are going to react when these regulations, when these agreements may interfere with their domestic regulations, in espe especially on cross-border data flows which are contained in their privacy and cybersecurity laws, because that would be a testing point. Um, and the worst case scenario might be that a few years from now in some IGF session, we will be sitting and talking about DEAs and how it was such a great initiative to address some of the problems with multilateralism, but eventually because of lack of political will, it fizzled out. But this is the worst, worst case scenario and certainly none of us on the panel are hoping for that. I, I, maybe I'm speaking on behalf of the entire panel, but thank you. Well, thank you, Neha. And that has certainly happened with many agreements in, in the internet space. Um, so look, why don't we go to some of the online folks to get them engaged too because, uh, so Stephanie, are you able to uh, take the mic and speak to us? Uh, let, let's see, can you hear me? Yes, fantastic, hi. Wonderful, okay, well, thank, thank you very much, Bill. Um, and uh, you know, there's uh, so much to agree with in what Neha has said. In fact, uh, I, I feel a little bit redundant, but let me try to add um, some other insights to, to her comments. I think it's quite interesting to um, pick up on the point that she made about the fact that the, the authors of these new style of agreements are really um, very like-minded, uh, particularly the first of these digital economy agreements, the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, or DEPA, um, was between uh, New Zealand, Singapore, and Chile. And, you know, I guess if you had to make a generalisation about them, they're all small economies, very open economies, very trade-oriented. Um, and... I think, as Niha pointed out, the fact that those uh, countries, you know, why why would they need an agreement? I think there's a very important sort of modelling and demonstration effect that is very deliberately the, the purpose of these new style of agreements. Um, in fact, very explicitly, the authors of the DEPA um, intended that it should be a model for others and, and a, a mechanism, if you like, for coherence in internet governance and particularly when it comes to things like cross-border data flows and avoiding forced data localization. Um, and this is reflected in uh, the structure of the agreement. Um, it has this modular structure that you mentioned in your own introduction. Um, and I think the idea is that countries could either seek to join the DEPA so they could accede to the agreement and as you mentioned, we have already seen uh, uh, quite a momentum building on that. But also, um, very explicitly, they could, if they liked what the DEPA has said on, on one particular element, e-invoicing, for example, or AI, or any of these other myriad of topics, they could choose to pluck out that module and put it into their own trade agreement. And in this way, I think the, the authors of the DEPA intended that it's a model, uh, a kind of a model agreement for how to develop good, coherent uh, internet governance and um, seek to, to populate that around the world rather than necessarily everybody having to join the same agreement. Because from a business perspective, if um, the rules are largely um, homogeneous, that's that's a good outcome for business. It enables better cybersecurity outcomes and so on. Um, so that's a really important concept in the, the DEPA, that it's a building block towards greater international coherence. Um, and uh, we have a parallel process going on in the WTO at the moment, the World Trade Organization, which is trying to develop, shall we say, global um, rules for digital trade. And I think the, the three countries that originated the DEPA also intended that this would be an influence on that. And I think, as you mentioned in your introduction, we've seen quite a number of these DEAs now being developed in digital partnerships, which very much are part of the same legacy of the, the DEPA. And I think in that sense, we can see that this concept of trying to develop a sort of model approach is in fact starting to gather some momentum. It's being picked up by 
quite a number of other contexts. And in fact, in Deeper itself, as you mentioned, we have Korea that has exceeded. So there are four members. And in the queue to join, we have Canada, China, um, Costa Rica, Peru, and the UAE. So there's quite a queue now forming of countries that would want to come on board this model. Um, I, I think there's one other really important concept. Um, I know that Marta will pick up on many of these other issues as well, but I think it's really important um, conceptually that the DEPA is about trade in the digital economy. Um, this is a sort of a new approach to regulating uh, economic activity in the data-driven economy, if you like, um, and very explicitly talks about trade in the digital economy rather than digital trade. Um, and in the preamble of the DEPA, it talks about a lot of socio-technical and, and sort of civil rights and, and um, human rights and other issues that have a bearing on what happens in the digital economy. So just to touch on a, a few of the terms that are mentioned in the preamble, corporate social responsibility, cultural identity and diversity, environmental protection and conservation, gender equality, indigenous rights, labor rights, inclusive trade, sustainable development, and tradi traditional knowledge, as well as the importance of preserving their right to regulate in the public interest. And let me just close by saying there are a number of specific provisions on that through the agreement, which I'm sure we can talk about uh, later on in the conversation, but let me finish there. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Stephanie, that was very helpful. And actually, I didn't know about Costa Rica and the UAE, so that means there are four members now in the DEPA and five people, five countries waiting to join. So this is a growing kind of uh, phenomena, which is quite interesting. Let's flip back to the, the panel here. And Marta, would you like to go next? Uh, yes. So um, I will basically build um, uh, build on what uh, Stephanie and, and, and Nea said. And I think it is important when we talk about uh, digital economy agreement and, and DIPA, first of all, to understand the origins of these agreements and why, especially in the trade community, it is important to uh, understand how different these agreements are. Um, if you, for those who may be not in incredibly familiar with, uh, with trade, at the basis, the institutional uh, framework at the basis of the world trading system uh, is characterized by the World Trade Organization, which was uh, founded in 1995. The multilateral trade agreements that govern trade in the world uh, were negotiated between 1986 and 1994. So before or at the incipit of what um, we could define as the fourth industrial uh, revolution. Uh, this means that uh, it already in 1998, uh, when at the WTO they launched a work program on e-commerce, there was an understanding that the internet that became publicly available in 1995 was going to revolutionize the way we will trade and we will produce and distribute uh, uh, goods and services. What has happened is that um, basically the rules of the game at multilateral level, so that apply to all WTO members, are rules that were negotiated over 30 years ago. And not much has been done in terms of negotiating new rules adapting to the 21st century. Uh, the first attempts to do this were preferential trade agreements. In 2000, uh, with the US-Jordan uh, mm, bilateral agreement and New Zealand and Singapore were the first agreements to include a provision on paperless trading or a chapter on e-commerce. So something started in the early 2000s and that was the approach that uh, became basically the most typical to try to create new rules of the game for the digital economy up until 2020. In 2020, big things happened, and that is the negotiation of DIPA and the negotiation of the first uh, digital, e properly named digital economy agreement between Singapore and Australia. And that is because they realized that it was not enough. Multilateral negotiations at the WTO were not proceeding, but technology was advancing. A lot was happening in, in that context, and therefore, this is why countries like Singapore, Chile, and, and New Zealand were the first to basically open the gates for this new approach, modular approach to negotiating um, these, uh, this topic. As Stephanie mentioned and, and Bill mentioned, um, one of the 
most important aspect of, of these agreements is the modular structure. So the fact that we are no longer negotiating all the issues together uh, related to e-commerce, but all the key issues are negotiated already separately. They have separate treatment. But also, DIPA was the first standalone agreement that was focused entirely on trading in the digital economy. So completely delinkages this issue from anything else that had been discussed uh, from trade. One of the characteristics of this, and this will be the other point that I want to make, is in terms of content, one of the key sort of novelties of this agreement is, for example, that DIPA is the first to ever mention a provision on artificial intelligence. This is how forward-looking these agreements are. With best endeavor language, they introduce topics that will be become the dominant topics in the decades to come. The other important issue that I think we need to underline regards the membership of these agreements. As it was uh, pointed out, we have uh, the first countries were Chile, uh, New Zealand, and Singapore. Uh, there are other countries that want to say DIPA. The, Uni the United Kingdom has signed similar agreements with um, Ukraine and Singapore, the United States have uh, done a, a digital partnership, uh, digital trade uh, agreement with uh, Japan. Uh, we have something going on also at the European Union level. But what is interesting is that the, the vast majority of the countries that so far have been involved in the negotiation or signing of these agreements are developed economies or in cases of some developing economies like Chile, and for example, Costa Rica that is interested in exiting DIPA, these are countries that are high up in, in the index of digital uh, readiness. Singapore ranks first, and it might explain why Singapore is sort of heralding this kind of like new era of DIPA and digital economy agreements. But it means also that most likely countries that, w that are maybe not developed but less developed countries may be interested in these agreements at the moment if they have a higher level of <coughs> digital readiness. So for the future, these uh, agreements could be, of course, the basis for, uh, for example, future negotiations and could lead the way for other countries. But probably the first to follow will be countries that are higher in, uh, in uh, digital readiness. One of the characteristics of some of these agreements is that they not, do not explicitly include provisions on capacity building. So maybe this is one thing that we need to keep in mind, that this uh, model could be useful if we also start thinking of extending this module to other countries by attracting them, for example, by having a little bit more explicit provisions on capacity building. Um, and I end Great. here. Thank you very much, Marta. That was excellent. Um, let's go back to our online participants. Uh, we've been talking a lot about the modular nature of these agreements. Uh, Chris Riley has been thinking a lot about modularity as a, a way of trying to foster cooperation among countries on internet governance and digital ec economy kinds of issues. Uh, Chris, would you like to say a few words? Happy to. Thanks cool. for having me, Bill. Thanks for having me. Great to be able to connect virtually. Sorry, I can't be there in person. This is going to be a little bit different because this is not modularity. What I want to talk about is not modularity in the context of international trade agreements, but rather modularity in how it can be useful as a tool to mediate uh, disparate regulatory regimes coming online at the national and regional level. As my colleague Susan Ness and I use the term, modularity is a multi-stakeholder, multinational paradigm for digital platform governance. That part sounds the same. We start from the assumption that national and regional laws are expanding quite rapidly in their influence in the modern era. The EU's Digital Service Act joins the e-safety law in Australia. On the horizon, we have the online safety bill in the United Kingdom, codes of practice developing around the world. Now, this thicket of forthcoming regulation is, is quite arguably necessary. But it comes at a cost, and in particular, it comes at a risk of fragmentation. It's the same landscape that digital economy agreements are coming online to try to address by fostering substantive agreement. As Susan and I work on modularity, we propose a sort of parallel modular operational alignment to complement that and try to foster alignment at that level. Regardless, 
we know we are uh, at risk of heading for a future of, of disparate regulatory lenses, greater inequality, greater difficulty for the protection of fundamental human rights and other challenges if we don't get this right. So let me be a little bit more specific about what I'm talking about. Transparency into platform practices is something that we sort of expect universally. It's appearing in laws all around the world. And we see efforts like the Action Coalition on Transparency, I know there's some representatives of that work here, building global best practices for transparency as a means of ensuring that platforms can meet these individual legislative expectations uh, in an efficient way with internal development and reporting that can be shared across regions. There are two other operational challenges gaining in their popularity in digital governance laws as they are adopted around the world. And neither at the moment is on track for an effective multinational alignment. One of these is researcher access. So the DSA in Europe requires some platforms to make available internal data to independent researchers solely for the purposes of allowing those researchers to study whether the platforms are in compliance with the DSA. There are a lot of other proposed laws that would have parallel but slightly different researcher access obligations. Now, the work of the European Digital Media Observatory and Rebecca Trombel of George Washington University, this work has gone far to show the value of multi-stakeholder input into DSA compliance and implementation. They released a flagship report that proposes the use of an independent intermediary body that would handle some of the implementation necessary for the researcher access mandate within the DSA. There would, they would propose a creation of a body that would accept requests from researchers for access to platform data under this law. They would vet the researchers. They would ensure that their proposal is consistent with the purposes of the statute, that it has necessary safeguards and so forth in it. And then they would issue a recommendation. Now, the hesitation here is that this is solely within scope of the DSA. So it doesn't get to this broader challenge that this conversation today is about, which is about how do we foster alignment across multiple jurisdictions as a means of discouraging the sort of splintering and, and disparate regulatory lens, uh, lenses across the world. So the question is, can you take that body, that concept, and have it be multinational? The promise of modularity, it gets realized if you imagine that same body taking requests from researchers outside the EU and vetting them in the same way and working to make the same kinds of recommendations available on a multinational basis. And where we really see the promise of modularity is if future laws in the online platform governance space look to those same bodies and structures, that same researcher vetting body and say, if you say a researcher is okay, we're going to give you a presumption of validity under our law as well. There's a separate operational challenge, arguably even more important, it depends on your point of view, which is risk assessment and audit. And in the same way as researcher access, multiple laws in multiple jurisdictions are on track to require risk assessments and audits to be done by platforms to show that they are behaving in a responsible way. A modular process would see the development of a shared transnational knowledge base that can guide those assessments and can train those auditors against a common standard. That increases alignment in the outcomes of the operational steps necessary to implement these researcher access mandates. But at the end of the day, and this is important, it does not undermine sovereignty in the individual governments to take direct enforcement action where they see fit. Modularity in this sense offers three advantages over relying solely on government enforcement actions. First, it resists the development of inconsistent international norms and standards, very much like digital economy agreements in that way. Second, modularity reduces the effort needed for governments to implement and enforce their laws. They don't have to vet every researcher request that comes in. They don't have to set up their own frameworks for auditors and for risk assessment. They can rely on the shared multinational body. And yet at the same time, they would retain the right and ability to do their own thing when push comes to shove when they need to as a means of understanding that their fundamental sovereignty is not being violated. Third and finally, modularity improves the process of enforcement for outside stakeholders. It encourages participation of more bodies in these mechanisms, in these implementation mechanisms, rather than having them face a diversified environment. If you imagine dozens of countries around the world processing slightly distinct risk assessment and audit frameworks, 
you're going to cost price out any advocacy organization that's trying to be influential here. And, the, and it will only be within the reach of large multinational corporations to be able to effectively engage on all of these frameworks all at the same time. So this is in many ways, I believe, very complementary to modularities we see in digital economy agreements. Modularity, as Susan and I use the term, is looking at operational alignment of implementation. The trade agreements are focused on substantive alignment, either by themselves help reach this goal that we're all working towards of increased international environment. And together, they can amplify each other and produce a stronger and more effective digital platform governance future. Thanks, Chris. I actually think that uh, there's a great deal of synergy in terms of operational as well as substantive and that the, the DEA frameworks and the DP frameworks that the EU have are also consistent with that. Let's, let's, thank you very much. Let's flip back to here. Uh, Mako, would you like to, would you like to go next? Uh, uh, let me pass this down to you. Uh, Ellie, could you do this? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And thank you for having me here. Uh, it's quite a pleasure to join this sort of interesting interaction from the different perspective. And especially when I'm coming from the government, it's very nice to be back to the point, square point, that we used to have the trade rules, but now we're really looking into new mechanism. So which means that we all coming from the different background, but we're actually trying to find the answer to this question, which is how do we create a new mechanism in addressing digital and of course, internet governance issues that everybody agreed that under sort of challenges because obviously previously we thought that trade rule can solve something, mm -hmm. but actually we, we are facing the boundaries. Then what now? Mm -hmm. So it's quite interesting to hear from the, 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 the previous authors talking about modularity and how digital economic agreement are trying to address those new challenges and getting success. And actually, I'm here, I'm not coming from the digital economic agreement background, but I come from the data governance background. And on behalf of the Japanese government, I am in the team to develop the what is called the institutional arrangement for partnership, which we're trying to create a new uh, governance uh, mechanism uh, in terms of enhancing the cross-border transfer of data under the banner of data free flow with trust. So data free flow with trust, it sounds uh, slightly weird as an English, but ex excuse us, that has been issued by the late Prime Minister Abe. He's also Japanese, not good at English. Huh? We, we, are, we're, we have the reputation of not good at English. Mm -hmm. But you, you take the concept, which is when the data flows, we need a trust. And this trust actually pinned down this particular element of governance. And for us, governance means that, of course, there can be an international rule that can you know, strongly coordinate by the naval international law. But if you look at the field of data, particularly data from the, um, pri uh, the privacy and data from the security, it's very difficult to have one single rule comes in and start coordinating across the sovereignty. It's not gonna happen. Which means that for the policy makers, the question is how we can have the effective policy coordination. What is the setting? So by tackling this question, of course, I mean, DPA, I see the similar challenges and of course, modularity. This really provide a way for the policy makers to make the trouble smaller, which is when you're trying to have the policy coordination on data, when it is mingled between the trade and the privacy and it's important to solve this question. So separate the question into the module that really makes sense. But at the same time, even within the topic, like privacy, then how do you actually coordinate the different privacy regulation? That's another question for the policymakers because even though we understand each other super well, each other's constitutional setting, still people cannot just have the one single rule. This is where the institutional arrangement for partnership comes in as an idea. So this idea is basically, it's a mechanism of much stakeholder to help the policy coordination uh, in the existing um, G2G, government to government fora. So we are not creating a government to government to fora from the beginning, which means that it's almost like a date, you know, world data organization. This is not what we're doing. We help the existing international organization or existing in a regulatory um, conversation, which is on the privacy or security, already the moderate. But the, the thing is, sometimes like when you need 
the support from technology, for example, when you have some stuck in the privacy regulators talk, I mean, they're doing great, great job, but we're not gonna have the one single rule. Then perhaps like, you know, like for example, privacy enhancing technology kicks in. But question is whether or not this privacy enhancing technology is actually equivalent or good enough to sort of like, uh, you know, overcome the difference or gaps. Then we need to have sort of like a way to cooperate the technology into those policy discussion paths like a regulatory sandbox exercise make, make sense. But all these project idea often just comes in as ad hoc. You know, but all these talk must be continuous, build upon one project after another. And this is where we come from, this idea of institutional arrangement partnership, which is we host the different working groups topic by topic to support those existing government panels discussion on the policy coordination. Um, by the permanent secretary to project manage, you know, review, and make sure that those projects are actually fitted into the policy talk. This way, it's not an ad hoc, it's multilateral, but also a multi-stakeholder. I mean, this is, so I think this is more like a complementary to the idea of the, the uh, digital economic agreement and other also hard agreement. But yeah, but I think that this is everything is just happening at the same time and it's all new. So I'm quite excited to see how these new mechanisms actually work together. Perhaps we might be talking about the same thing. We're happy to also discuss on that, but I stop here now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mika. That's very interesting. So just to clarify, the, the, the uh, new mechanism that's being developed under the G7, the, uh, Institute, uh, <laughs> the acronym drives me crazy, IAP. Yeah. The time frame for actually booting that up among the G7 countries Actually, in the coming month. We coming promised month. to summit. And also, we kind of discussed this among the G7, but DFFT was actually the concept brought up to the G20. Mm -hmm. And what we are now trying to develop is not, of course, limited to the G7. This is, because I said this existing international organization. So we kind of connect the international organizations, government board. Right. But first, we set up the permanent secretary, secretary art in the one international organization. We're now talking, because we have to finish it within the co in coming month, as I promised in mm -hmm. April. Yes. Okay. And it'll have different work streams that are proceed at different paces, depending on the issues and so on. Of course, but like the first module. we start from just having a several working groups set up, mm -hmm. then right. perhaps like a different working group have different pace in how it's gonna proceed. Okay. That's how I perceive it. New that. international mechanism being born, folks. Um, if you didn't know about it. Let's go back online to the last of our three online speakers, Rick Sammons with the International Labor Organization in Geneva. Rick, would you like to uh, say a few words? Sure, thanks, uh, thanks very much, Bill. <coughs> and good, good day to everybody. A lot of really helpful and useful uh, points have been made. Maybe I'll just add a couple of uh, broader points or reflections. The first, is that uh, I, um, I would submit that these digital economy types of agreements are, uh, are promising. They're a salutary development uh, from the standpoint of international economic cooperation and governance, in my view, uh, in, in essence, because they are a recognition that uh, it's critical to go beyond a purely or mainly market access approach to these issues, which has really been a hallmark of the first, say, 10 or 15 years of the treatment of this issue, particularly in international economic relations. So that alone at, at root uh, offers significant promise uh, here. And I know that this should resonate with internet uh, governance forum uh, community because I've <clears throat> certainly heard over the years quite a, a bit of frustration being expressed by those involved in internet governance and telecommunications policy about the somewhat siloed approach by their economic policy and trade policy uh, counterparts uh, to these issues. And so I think that this provides an opportunity for better, better integration, both substantively as well as notably procedurally. In other words, uh, you know, the much more multi-stakeholder a culture of policy making in the inter internet government world is going to be needed if uh, if these digital economy uh, agreement uh, approaches are to be successful. That's that's my first point. Second one is you know let me reflect on the big question that you posed, Bill, which is you know what's the likely impact here 
on internet fragmentation. Uh, and I would submit that it is, as much as I think that, that uh, these agreements are very promising, I would argue for your consideration that their influence on internet fragmentation is very much an open question. And in two respects in particular. One is you've got to go, you know, kind of below the surface to some of the primary uh, expressed interests and indeed uh, requirements of some of the key parties uh, in, in the world on these issues. And so, for example, in the uh, a regional comprehensive economic partnership, which is sort of a broader framework where you've got a lot of Asian countries, including China, involved, there, there is a treatment of a number of these issues. But for example, you know, localization is explicitly allowed in that agreement. Forced disclosure of source code explicitly allowed. Contrast that with uh, approaches in, in chapters of agreements or even, even in the, uh, you know, other uh, self-contained agreements in this area. Uh, for example, the USMCA, the United States uh, Mexico Canada agreement and its chapter in this area, or the CPTPP and whatnot, you got a you got a different fundamental uh, approach on some key issues there. For example, platforms in the USMCA are not to be liable for third party content. Uh, platforms are free to delete content. Digital service taxes should not be imposed in ways that de facto hit the the big platform uh, companies. Uh, you know, source code is treated differently. So, you know, we have to be realistic here that there are significant differences on fundamental issues, lest we get too excited about the potential for these uh, being instruments to narrow internet fragmentation. The second uh, dimension of this cautionary note uh, is less political. It's more, it's more uh, you know, substantive in a way. And that is that if you look at these agreements and the chapters and trade agreements that treat these subjects, they tend to have a lot of exceptions, standard exceptions. Uh, and that's why I think what Neha said at, at the outset in a, in a more polite way uh, is why quote unquote political will is ultimately what's gonna be required here. Uh, these are, a f much of these agreements are, you know, in terms of their specific uh, language are principles-based. They're really principles or directionally oriented indications of normative, normative direction, if you will, and commitment, which is extremely important. Don't, don't, don't mistake what I'm saying as undervaluing the significance of what's in these agreements. But at the end of the day, what's really going to be important is what Chris Riley was talking about a few moments ago, which is the actual regulatory cooperation that goes on. That's going to be the ultimate test of how much these agreements actually do contribute to uh, reducing fragmentation, if not globally, at least in big local chunks of, of economic and uh, internet activity uh, in the world. So uh, I, again, I salute uh, Chris for taking us through some very concrete uh, examples of that. So th we go from you know, kind of the broad policy making level to really what's going to make a difference. And so I'll leave you uh, uh, with that. Thanks. Back to you, Bill. Thanks, uh, Rick. Actually, the, we we view the question of their their utility for fragmentation as an open question too. So don't worry. Uh, you're, you're very much in sync with the rest of us on that. Okay. Last of our speakers is Ellie Nome. Last but not least, Ellie, would you like to offer some thoughts, and then we'll go to a little more open discussion. Is the mic working? If you speak into it. All right. Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> I'm very, very, <clears throat> very happy to be back at IGF. In fact, I was <clears throat> sorry. I was in Tunis uh, in 2005 when the IGF system was set up, and uh, there there was a very stellar cast of characters there. There were about 20 national presidents, most of whom by now have been overthrown, <laughs> uh, and uh, and and so every communications minister in the world was there. Uh, and, and so we talked about big picture type issues, kind of the, the forest, not the trees. 
So the, the, it is important as we discuss these things uh, here now, the, the, the DES, not to be just in the trees and in the leaves, in fact, but also see and think about what are we doing here? Where is this leading to? What are the dynamics? And so let me suggest then three problems and three advantages of this new system or emerging system and then make a little, very little proposal. So the first problem that I see here is uh, fragmentation. And while I appreciate uh, the, uh, being the, the previous speaker talking about this being an open question, I think t uh, to me it's a kind of a totally clear question. It enhances fragmentation. How can it not? You have groups of countries that come together with a certain shared perspective and certain shared interest and uh, f uh, economic philosophy and whatever, and they will form some kind of treaty as we have here now with New Zealand, et cetera. And then there will be countries that have a different perspective and they will in fact, since the, uh, this particular uh, uh, agreement is almost kind of open-ended, they will recruit members into their coalition, others will recruit to the other coalition. The only positive thing that you can say is, so clearly it's going to enhance fragmentation. What you can say is it's happening anyway. So positive on the positive side, well, it at least formalizes the fragmentation process that is emerging anyway. It puts it into some documents. It makes it a little bit more transparent. All right, so that was problem number one. Problem number two is that some of these coalitions will be clearly with the aim of being restrictive. So things that a country, say, against platforms cannot do by itself, it will then kind of establish coalitions of like-minded countries to uh, deal with, with problems of the uh, platforms, uh, partly to tax them, partly to restrict them, partly to require them to kind of do content moderation in certain ways. It's totally inevitable that these things will happen. Uh, thirdly, is that, uh, and that's a more of a constitutional issue, that it delegates uh, functions that should be more legislative to administrative trade officials. So take, for example, AI. Uh, AI, those are complicated issues, and people around the world are thinking about them. Uh, and there should be, and I don't think that, for example, the United States you should right now pass any law uh, uh, that would find a majority, partly because we don't quite know exactly what to do. So if you make this into a trade negotiation issue, the trade negotiators then come back and say, well, we now are bound our country to some form of a, a treatment of AI because we've signed this trade document. This is for people in the NGO world should be give them a pause because it basically takes it away from a um, from a democratic elected uh, parliamentary type arrangement into one or people who are kind of market oriented from a market perspective it puts it into the hands hands of trade officials to set policies that are in effect digital policies of quite significance now uh, so those are my th the three problems. The uh, uh, briefly the fragmentation uh, the, the on the positive I said already fragmentation is inevitable. Second, it's uh, second one. It's it's a good experimentation process. You can figure out what works, what doesn't work, uh, ideally. Uh, and thirdly, uh, uh, it uh, well, uh, it's it's a mo much more flexible instrument. You don't have to have everything, the modularity, the flexibility, the ability to go, go in and go out, uh, creates create much more of a um, mechanism rather than these kind of huge trade negotiations where in effect at the end internationally you might kind of come up with a bunch of platitudes uh, and people go home and then they do what they want to do anyway. Uh, so here you have a bit more for concreteness. So, uh, so therefore, you hear my skepticism uh, about the uh, about the approach. But I also will say it's kind of inevitable because fragmentation is inevitable, and people kind of deny that, and they kind of have certain platitudes here too about kind of the importance of international arrangements. It's never been quite clear to me. Uh, why these things are so sacrosanct, a kind of commonality of interest does not exist. The United States has a different perspective than Iran, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. So any compromise of kind of some kind of global arrangements is neither going to satisfy Iran nor going to satisfy the United States. 
uh, and so, so, so why even try? So lastly, uh, my proposal here, slight, my, it's a small one, as a researcher, I would say let's at least kind of, uh, if you have a lemon, make a lemonade. If you got going to have 25 different uh, ar arrangements uh, around the world, let's have a curated data bank of these proposals uh, together with kind of an analytic literature that will emerge so we know kind of how people analyze this. So we could figure out best practices, worst practices, et cetera, et cetera. So there should be some kind of an intelligent data bank, database uh, with research uh, that's done outside or inside. I already know who should do that. He's sitting right next to me. So that's, the, that's uh, my, uh, my uh, final proposal. Thanks, Ellie, for being provocative and helping to juice the conversation a little bit. Of course, we have to remember the, the, the language issues that we get into, fragmentation of the policy environment versus fragmentation of the internet in an operational sense, different dimensions interrelated, and so on, and both very, very cogly important. Would, uh, before I uh, pose a couple questions to you from the the policy questions that we uh, uh, have on, on the program, uh, can I ask if any of the, the panelists would like to respond to anything each other said? To get any, is there online folks? Uh, Rick, you wanna, I see Rick and Stephanie both raising their hands, that's good because you know, actually it's easier if you raise your hand because you're in a tiny little box and that I'm looking at on the screen far away, so that's helpful. Uh, Rick, go ahead and then Stephanie. Yeah, just to extend the uh, the discussion here on the fragmentation question, you know, um, I, mean, I think clearly these agreements are not going to solve fragmentation uh, in e either of those dimensions, Bill, on a global basis. That's clear. But what I do think we shouldn't underestimate is that to the extent that a a significant and expanding subset of governments that matter economically. Uh, are are beginning to align their policies and very particularly their regulatory approaches on the main parameters here. That will create a momentum for a significant uh, improvement in coherence in the world economy. It won't. It will not eliminate fragmentation by at a global level by no by no stretch. But I I do think we should you know, have a textured view of this and recognize the potential, even if it is not for a complete win, which I think is unrealistic as uh, Professor Noam is saying on fragmentation, it could still make an enormous difference for a very significant subset of the world economy. Back that, to you. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Stephanie, go ahead. Uh, well, on a similar theme, I guess, uh, responding to Professor Noam, I, I think um, we need to take a step back and ask, why should we care about fragmentation? Um, you know, avoiding fragmentation is not an end in itself. I, I come from a, a business background and a former negotiator. So obviously I, I bring that perspective to the conversation. But if you look at it from a sort of an economic growth uh, perspective or an inclusive economic growth perspective, you know, how can business utilize the digital economy to, you know, raise living standards and improve lives in, in their own countries and, and for people in other countries. Um, that's why fragmentation matters, because if we see massive regulatory heterogeneity, you know, huge constraints on cross-border data flows or forced data localization, that makes it very hard to do business across borders to supply the services that consumers in other countries might want to, uh, you know, grow your own economy through trade. Um, and I think, uh, uh, Professor Noam, as you sort of mentioned yourself, you know, this is happening anyway. Well, since the start of the pandemic, um, the um, global trade alert, the digital trade alert based in, in Geneva um, has calculated that there have been about 3,000 regulatory interventions um, in digital trade by you know, sort of global governments. So if we do nothing, what we're seeing is this, you know, fragmentation, the the patchwork of different approaches. And for business, 
that makes it incredibly expensive and difficult or impossible to do business across borders. So, you know, it's an imperfect science, of course, and there are important different perspectives that will never be reconciled. But equally, you know, if, if we see a value in uh, sort of achieving inclusive growth, I think there's, there's a, a really important job of work to do to try to increase coherence and, and minimise the fragmentation, which I think this sort of model is designed to do by creating a platform for countries and policymakers and regulators and, and other stakeholders to actually have those conversations about, well, we're never going to agree on everything, but is there a kind of a, a sweet spot where we can, you know, have data flowing, we can have trade flowing, and we can all benefit from that. Great. Thanks, Stephanie. Martha? Yes, I, I wanted to um, follow up on the point on, on AI. Um, one of the things that I need, we need to two things to keep in mind when we think about these new models, DIPA and DARE. One was definitely the fact that it was a response to the fact that multilateral negotiations were stalling, and what was negotiated so far in bilateral agreements in traditional FTA was not enough to keep up with technological progress. So one of the reasons why we have AI included in these agreements it's kind of like the understanding and recognition that there are some technologies that are about to or bound to have a massive effect on trade, but not only trade, in the years to come. I agree with your point of um, there is concern of um, including AI under a, a trade agreement, especially because one of the characteristics of uh, uh, international trade law uh, is that it is probably one branch of uh, international pub public law that is the most binding. Once you, you get it into an agreement, it's much easier to enforce these rules than maybe other agreements. But I think that potentially a solution to maybe um, uh, address some of the concerns maybe of NGOs and, and the civil society about including provisions on AI is uh, maybe to involve the civil society, and not only the civil society, but uh, maybe businesses and other parts of society in the negotiations beforehand. I think that one of the aspects of especially these newest topics, such as AI, is that this is a technology that has an impact that goes way beyond trade, way beyond the economy, and therefore it's very important to include a lot of other stakeholders in, the, in these sort of conversations probably in the same way as these DIPA and, and, and DIAs are new models to approach uh, the negotiations of the rules in digital trade, we could also start thinking about having new approaches to the negotiating process itself by expanding or ameliorating uh, the participation of, of civil society, especially when dealing with uh, certain issues related to emerging technologies. Thanks, Marta. Yeah, I think one of the things that has to be emphasized is that indeed both the digital economy agreement uh, li like DIPA uh, and the digital partnership frameworks being done by the EU explicitly build in the possibility of multi-stakeholder cooperation within the different uh, modules, which also sounds like something that you intend to do with the, the new mechanism you folks are, are building. So this is an interesting for people in the internet governance world who have always argued that you know, one needs to take a more multi-stakeholder approach and uh, that uh, some of the purely intergovernmental approach may not be sufficiently democratic, inclusive, and so on, this would seem to be a positive development in terms of the bringing people into engagement on AI and so on uh, in structured, ongoing, institutionalized dialogues between countries. But let's go back to the, the issue of fragmentation a little bit more tightly and then we'll open it up to everybody, because we have a lot of interesting people in the room here with us who have thoughts on these issues, I'm sure. Um, just uh, the, one of the one of the there's been reference made to how the digital economy agreements sort of compare to traditional digital trade kinds of approaches. The digital trade agreements, as Rick w Sammons was pointing out, do have language pertaining to questions of cross-border data flow, data localization, uh, mandatory disclosure of source source code all these other kinds of issues that many in the private sector view as potential forms of digital uh, protectionism and as uh, creating barriers to the flow of data uh, over the internet. Um, 
putting these into the trade environment, because you're entering into binding kinds of agreements, raises stakes, makes everybody sit up straight, and tightens the nature of the discussions, and makes it hard for people to actually agree. So you get then outcomes where uh, you have agreements like the, the RCEP, which China is a member of. China will not sign off on a framework that makes strong binding commitments against data, uh, forced data localization or barriers to data flow because that's fundamental to its policy framework. So if you're gonna have a digital trade agreement between parties who are fundamentally on different sides of, of the, the uh, table on this, you end up with a weak agreement or no agreement at all. The idea of the digital economy frameworks is that you can institutionalize dialogue and ongoing interaction between the parties to try to incrementally move them closer together on some of these issues and allow uh, side developments and discussions and stuff. So let's talk a little bit more about the relationship specifically between these kinds of frameworks and fragmentation of the internet. Not just fragmentation of whether or not policymakers around the world all have harmonized approaches or different approaches, but the internet fragmentation itself. What are the linkages we see in terms of how these agreements have been tried, how they've tried to address fragmentation issues, and how they might be able to address fragmentation issues? Neha, would you like to say something about that? Did yeah. You've worked on those issues. Um, thank you. Thanks, Bill. Um, so I think uh, when you think of internet fragmentation, and I'm, Bill, I'm borrowing from your work where you kind of put it down to technical fragmentation, commercial fragmentation, and governmental fragmentation. Um, and I think uh, the best way to look at these uh, new agreements and their potential to reduce fragmentation would be to start with more modest ideas of how, it can, how, how that's possible. Um, so I think one thing which we emphasize is that these agreements have different building blocks. And the fact that you can look at interoperability, let's say, in, a low in an area of low politics, such as e-payments or e-invoicing, e can then lead to more incremental trust building in areas which are more difficult uh, and which involve more high politics. And just to give you an example, um, e-invoicing uh, was, so the format, the standard for e-invoicing was a big contentious issue for countries for a long time. And all, so with the, with the introduction of the DEPA and then subsequent uh, DEAs, they, they adopted a common standard. So if you look at the later DEAs, the, the, the language is clear that you will use the PEPOL standard. And this would have been very hard in the WTO context with the, because the PEPOL standard doesn't come from an intergovernmental body. Uh, but it comes from a, uh, from a private not-for-profit organization. So that itself, the fact that some of that trade vocabulary is missing made it very easy to adopt such a standard. And Mata mentioned about the provision on AI. Again, there is nothing in that that prevents these governments to consider principles and norms that are developed in transnational bodies and multi-stakeholder bodies and incorporate them by reference. Uh, in trade agreements, and the, the language is already quite open that they would do so, and some of the later DAs, for instance, talk about the global partnership on art artificial intelligence, or the OECDI principles, so the, so, the, so the entry points are all in there, um, and I think, again, on technical fragmentation, I'll highlight the focus on open standards and open licensing practices in several of these DAs, which would, in effect, mean that the you know, the digital, the using, build, using proprietary technologies which can create these digital walled gardens is going to be prevented. So it is, not a, it is not a dramatic effect on internet fragmentation, but I think it is gradually building into the smaller blocks which eventually can help in internet fragmentation. Where I am most doubtful is governmental fragmentation, and I think mm -hmm. uh, many of us have already discussed that because that's where, where sovereignty is concerned. Um, their governments might be a lot more reluctant uh, because it's not only, perhaps it's protectionism as well, but often it, these things get very easily tied to national security agendas. And the exceptions, as uh, Rick mentioned, uh, they can be quite broad 
uh, in many of these agreements. Uh, and they can, even if they are tightly worded, the interpretation is still, we don't know how that will go before trade tribunals. So, <laughs> we, and you, actually that's not the purpose of these DAs to go to the exceptions, uh, because that's when something goes wrong. The, the purpose of these DAs is to focus on cooperation and trying to avoid the point where we have to figure out what these exceptions, how these exceptions might apply. Thanks, that's very helpful. Mako, would you like to say something about, uh, in this regard? Uh, on fragmentation, the yeah. inner fragmentation in cooperation through these kinds of mechanisms or sure, the ones you're doing, and then Ellie, sure, absolutely. Okay, yeah, on the topic of the internet fragmentation or fragmentation in general, I mean, it's quite important to think about, I mean, particularly I'm coming from the policy maker aspect. We are always thinking about how these international agreement would interact with those domestic regulations which are already there. Because often the change in the domestic regulation is a painful process for many policymakers, but also the constituencies. Because regulations are often tied to the existing culture, you know, interest, et cetera, et cetera. But out there, the situation is already changing, so we need to change the regulation. Right. So which means this is not something like you have the regulation and you have to change. It's not like this. It's have to be incremental. It always have to be processed. That is why I definitely agree with the discussion here that we need to have the, the place, forum, the where relevant people, not only the government, but also multi-stakeholder people have the solution outside of the government to work together and gradually, in less painful way, to change the domestic regulation if necessary. But we have to think about it. It's, we're not gonna have this single rule. So when we talk about fragmentation, we tend to think like we have to have one single internet, international rules, like the way of the trade agreement. But this is not something that would work nowadays. So we have to think about the certain project base that we talk about, we identify what are the bottlenecks in those questions and we one by one, we talk or we kind of come up with a project to have more pragmatic way to solve the, the solutions. This is this kind of pragmatic way is also very necessary and important from the aspect of the regulators and also policy makers. Because often when you talk about data flow, people are gonna say, oh, from, from the free trade aspect, data should flow, that's the requirement of the digital, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas the privacy regulators, they, they're not gonna think in that way. So we need a time process, right. so that's something we can, I can add it from that aspect. Absolutely, and that, uh, both what you're building and what these uh, frameworks are building is that kind of institutionalized framework for incremental kind of, all right, Ellie? Well, um, I think you're on. If you push it up, there you go. All right, here. Um, there was a time when it made a lot of sense to have a unified approach all around the world. It was led by the United States, et cetera, in its companies and its uh, NSF, et cetera, et cetera. So that was the past. And if for in a growth situation, it probably made sense to have a certain kind of harmonization and internationalization of all this. But now kind of the internet has become, and digital economies become so complex and so fast moving and so successful and so permeating every aspect of, of, of society and, and uh, people's, people's lives and work and economy. Um, and the international arrangements simply have not kept up with the acceleration. In fact, if anything, they've kind of become slower because there are more countries, more interests involved, the interests are larger than before. So. So just because something was important in the past doesn't mean that it will be important now or in the future. And so, so when we talk about harmonizing and trying to integrate and overcome, it's all great, but kind of first there's always the implicit idea that we have everybody will come around to our position because our position makes so much sense, right? That's why we have that position. But in fact, in the real world, that doesn't happen that way. Uh, people have different interests. It's not just information. They don't know better. No, they do know, and they have concluded that that doesn't work for them. And so the harmonization aspect of all this is actually uh, has become a roadblock, I think, because mm -hmm. it retards innovation. It retards policy experimentation. It retards an awful lot of things. And so if we embrace it um, and channel it and do this in an intelligent way, and maybe some DEAs will kind of do that, although I predict that some of them will do exactly the opposite, but anyway, right. can't win them all. 
Thanks, Ellie. Well, it's true, and that's harmonization is tough, and that's why there's been more and more focus on interoperability of different policy frameworks. So you get uh, efforts to make the GDPR uh, interoperable with the APEC privacy rules and so on. Um, anybody, any of our people online want to get in on this point? Stephanie, yes, go ahead. Yes, thanks, Bill. Uh, look, just to add, um, I think your, your last comment about interoperability is a really key one. Um, you know, I think a lot of these digital economy agreements aren't actually trying to achieve the same approach. They're trying to achieve interoperable outcomes through a, a, a sort of a variety of different mechanisms, whether by reference to international standards or open standards, whether through regulatory sandboxes to see where there's common ground and so on. So um, I, th I think that that's uh, a really important innovation in this style of agreement. You know, most trade agreements that have gone before have been about setting binding, essentially, rules for how things are done to get a, an agreed outcome. But this is a, a very different model. And I think it's also really important to bear in mind, as you've characterized it, these different layers um, that are needed uh, to work harmoniously, whether um, you know, the technical or the commercial or the governmental. And you know, in that connection, this is not necessarily an act of deliberate difference of view. Um, it's, it's simply a sort of byproduct of uh, you know, countries coming up with their own approaches with a, you know, or commercial actors coming up with their own sort of technical approaches, which creates friction because they're not the same. So I think, you know, the mechanism of these agreements helps to provide a chance to discuss that and see if there's not a way that those systems can work together with less friction, rather than it being a, you know, a philosophical difference that could never be bridged. And I think something quite interesting that they've been able to achieve, I mean, there are clearly some basic questions of philosophy about, you know, individual and, and national sovereignty and so on that, that may never be bridged, whether you're, you know, uh, the United States or China or Iran or whoever, um, you know, there are very clearly different philosophies uh, in, at play there. But just to give one very concrete example, one of the areas of great sensitivity is around financial services data. Um, Countries are very allergic to uh, allowing that cross borders because, uh, you know, there are obviously really important considerations, sort of prudential considerations and others. Um, but the Australia Singapore Digital Economy Agreement has come up with quite an interesting way to address that. Um, the agreements that had gone before said you can have forced data localization for financial services data, essentially you know, you can require that to be kept in the, the country, um, the market in question. But in the Singapore-Australia DEA, um, they, they tried to find a way through that by saying, well, the data doesn't have to be kept um, just in, in the market. Uh, you know, there's no forced data localization, mm -hmm. but it has to be accessible to the, the relevant officials should it be, you know, needed. Um, so in that way, trying to come up with a very practical solution to how do you on the one hand satisfy the, the policy objective of, you know, good sound prudential regulation, while also allowing trade to happen, business to take place and, and you know, that financial services data to flow across borders. So I think, you know, there are innovative ideas that these DEAs can come up with. On the other hand, though, I'm a, a pretty cynical about um, whether some of those core issues around, um, you know, some of the sort of national security, let's say, or, or fundamental um, sort of human rights issues may be bridged. And I think we see the model that a lot of the DEAs use is very similar to the CPTPP model for cross-border data flows, which mm -hmm. says the default is that data can flow, but there are these exceptions. If there's a legitimate public policy objective, you know, governments mm -hmm. can prevent that data from flowing. And despite that, which sounds very open and, you know, is, is a really sort of pro cross-border data flows, in fact, we can see that one CPTP party, Vietnam, for example, has, um, you know, uh, a number of sort of cybersecurity regulations which require da data localization, 
CPTPP um, would seem to be, uh, you know, at odds with that, but Vietnam is a member. So I think, you know, the idea is there, but whether in reality we see, you know, how these regulations actually apply, that, that's a whole other story. But yeah. let me leave it there. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, it's true. The trade agreements all have these kind of exceptions uh, clauses where you have to say something's a legitimate public policy uh, issue and the re restrictions that are in place are no more restrictive than necessary, et cetera. And of course, that opens the door to exactly, well then, what, what counts within that. But let's open it up to the floor because we have folks here that I'd like to engage in the conversation uh, and we're past the top of the hour and uh, we can draw in the folks online more later. Uh, there may be um, not speakers, but participants online. Are you have a, a question in the chat? Okay, why don't we take that then? No, 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 you can just, you can type it. Oh, the they can type the, oh, okay, sorry. Neha's pointing out uh, that anybody who's listening online can type a question in the chat or you can ask for the floor, um, I believe. So, but let's start with the people in the room here. I see Marco has his hand up and then, okay, so let's go. I, and there's, there's a mic over there, if you could just pass it around and just push up the button and you're all good to go. Please say who you are. Um, where you come from, et cetera. And people behind me, let me know if you want to, I don't have eyes in the back of my head. I, th I, th I, think, I think I'm on now. It, 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 it's Marco Afwoning, uh, Dutch government, uh, these days. Um, uh, and, and my first intervention kind of was already stolen because I do concur with sort of the concerns raised by Eli earlier about sort of the modeler approach and then I am. I can now say I'm a recovering engineer, and and the joke used to be is the problem with standards is there are too many, and mm -hmm. I sense that we have the similar problem with with policies, and and while I do like the approach to to DEPA and like yes you can get a modular approach or some optional attributes, it also leads to challenges in the end for the user experience. It might it might not be fragmented in a true sense, but it might also not lead to having similar experiences. Um, but I'll, I'll try to keep this short. And where, where I'm going to is what I'm a bit missing here, and, and I often see that, is that we talk about agreements, and you kind of said, like, yes, they're binding, and yes, okay, these new economic partnerships sense to be less binding, but still often, and then Eli said it right. It's like at some point you have a small group that sort of partners up and the trick is to convince others to join. And I think what we're overlooking there is that in order for them to join, they also need a sense of agency and a sense of ownership. And I think what's particularly missing from a lot of these frameworks is a mechanism to evolve that framework and looking back to where we are here with the internet, I think, yes, it's very modular and layered, and that's part of a success story, but I think also a huge part of that success is that very early on the internet, we found a common way of working and evolving it. Mm -hmm. And basic agreement is, this is what we currently do, this is what we think is the best solution, but we're happy for you to convince us there is a better way forward. And we might also agree to disagree and do something different. And I think from a lot of these trade and economic frameworks, what I miss is actually sort of thinking about what are we going to do next? Okay, we've got 15 people. What if the 16th want to join but has a particular concern? How can we accommodate that? And that's what I like to give back to the floor. And of course, happy for the panelists to reflect on that idea. Thank you, Marco. It's very helpful. Uh, Yes, go ahead. Please introduce yourself. Hello. Uh, Ewan Lusty from Flink Global. Uh, thank you for the interesting discussion. On the question of whether digital economy agreements can limit fragmentation, uh, I would say yes, but I'd be cautious about overstating this. I was really interested to see the exam hear the examples of institutional cooperation discussed by Chris Riley and Mako Maguro, and I think there's real potential here but we should be clear that the political and geopolitical drivers of fragmentation will continue to exist and will in all likelihood intensify. And that in a more politically insecure and uncertain world, governments of all kinds will continue to pursue sovereignty, resilience, national security, 
and that that will limit their inclination to reach agreements that conflict with those objectives. Uh, I would also add that some of the political events that we've seen even in the last month um, have underlined how fragile cooperation is even amongst supposedly like-minded countries. Uh, and then finally, I, I'd say that cooperation in digital governance seems particularly fragile when we consider the changes of government that could take place in elections next year. <laughs> Let's not even go there. Uh, <laughs> scares me. Okay, thank you. It was very helpful. Uh, is there anybody behind me? Because I can't really see anybody. If anybody wants the floor, wants to make a comment, please let me know. Okay, gentleman down there. Yes. Okay. Um, Armando Mansueta from the Ministry of Economy, Planning and Development of the Dominican Republic. Okay. I find this is a very interesting topic um, and something that is, has been discussed in, at many levels, not, not with this name, uh, because in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, a few years ago with ICLAC, we've been, dis, uh, we've been discussing the possibility and exploring the possibility to establish a, a regional digital market that which covers most of the things that are uh, put into the, in the proposals of the, of the digital economy agreements. Um, but there are, there are many realities, political, economic, and social realities in many of our countries uh, that even though we wanted, for example, to, uh, to, uh, to, to reach an agreement on tho those kind of topics, we, will that we have the, the reality that most of our countries don't operate at the same level as others. Mm -hmm. So instead of, trying of, uh, of tightening the integration and adoption of similar standards and similar way of doing things, uh, we, what we what we're seeing is that we're, we're exacerbating the many of the barriers and many of the gaps that most of our country have, mostly because of political reasons. Because, um, like some, like the person that was behind me said, um, we have mm, we have many geopolitical aspects to have to take into have to take into consideration. We have cybersecurity aspects. Not all the countries uh, have the same belief or the same way of thinking regarding uh, data protection, uh, privacy, or the data sovereignty in the, in, the, in the context of how make that data interoperable so we can interchange that information safely from country to country. Uh, so that's just one thing. Regarding payments, it's the same thing. Not all the financial systems operate the same or have the same set of rules. So if, even though I understand that standards and uh, are, well, that can be, can be a hindrance to can be a hindrance to innovation, especially in a world that we must be moving quickly. Uh, the reality is that what the reality is they're quite important if you want to have that some, some level of standardization to reach these kinds of agreements. In that sense, uh, for countries that doesn't that are not at as at as advanced as others in regarding these sub subjects, how we can better apply the, the recommendations to reach to these sort of agreements with other nations that are more advanced than us. That is absolutely a crucial question, and one of the things that we I put on the um, description of the session was, you know, these agreements have been so far formed by countries at fairly comparable levels with like-minded kind of orientations. How, what are the possibilities for expanding in terms of uh, south, global south participation and so on? So look, we, that's three questions. Why don't we try and see if we get some responses to some of these from the panelists, and then we can hopefully come back around, and if there's a couple more, uh, then wrap that up, because it's after six o'clock and people are undoubtedly thinking of the gala and the sushi. Um, so uh, if, if any of the people on the uh, remote would like to, Chris, go ahead. Sure, so I'll take the middle one, which is the fundamental note of skepticism driven by the political environment. Obviously, I am sympathetic. I think that there is a really interesting tension uh, that was raised between Mako's point, which uh, Ellie echoed, that the old assumption of one set of international rules can't be the goal. That point, I think, is universally agreed by us all and resonates with the political environment they're operating in. But there's a tension between that and Rick's point, which I think we also all share and agree with, which is that we're operating with an increased baseline of alignment in perspective among many countries in how we approach digital platform governance. So I think that we're in this really weird place where we're not all going to agree we can't agree out of principle, and yet we're also kind of agreeing a little bit, at least on certain matters. Now, I take uh, Stephanie's point as well, national security issues, human rights issues, Marta's point, uh, AI, these are places where we're all far apart. NatSec and human rights are probably always going to be far apart. 
Um, Mako also referenced privacy earlier, which is another issue that despite decades of negotiations, we're all kind of collectively far apart on the international stage. But there are those places like transparency, like risk assessment and audit, where we're starting to see alignment. And my sort of perhaps overly optimistic hope is that building shared operational structures, more uh, digital economy agreements that lean in on those points where we are seeing some alignment will help uh, be a positive counterweight to some of the of the negative forces that are going. And, and layering into all of that and giving us something that we can build towards to, to try to advance this hope um, is Bill's point about increased space for multi-stakeholder engagement. More and more of these frameworks, more and more of these international agreements um, are, are recognizing the value of multi-stakeholder engagement as a fundamental process of figuring out answers to the, these hard questions. And I think there too, we can not only find some ground for optimism, but also additional hooks into building transnational substantive alignment. Thanks, Chris. I, absolutely, I think the, the procedural uh, uh, agreements around transparency, the other, these other kinds of things can be building blocks towards greater convergence incrementally on some of the substantive points. Rick, were you waving at me? Yeah, go ahead. So let me try to build on Chris's point um, and in doing so, respond a bit to the point uh, raised by our Dominican Republic uh, colleague. So as I said at the very beginning, one of the, one of the salutary things about this uh, modality of uh, cooperation and governance is that it's multifaceted, it's interdisciplinary, it's multi-stakeholder potentially, as uh, Chris has just uh, indicated, and gets us beyond the sort of narrow market access corporate-driven uh, genesis of so much of trade policy in many countries, uh, at least until uh, recent years. And, and let, me, let me extend that point a little bit uh, here, that um, one disciplinary access aspect that has not really been well picked up yet by uh, these agreements is um, our labor-related considerations, which is, you know, and, and perhaps this gets to some of the aspects of AI or algorithmic, algorithmic automation, but you know, uh, what are some norms about employee surveillance, performance evaluation, bias and performance evaluation, uh, the use of these tools for recruitment, uh, the protection of, uh, of worker uh, personal data, whether it be health or, or financial or otherwise. Uh, the transparency aspects are very important and they're beginning to be worked on as mentioned, but there's a realm, there's a series of realms of very important considerations that breaking open this beyond market access into wider considerations of regular cooperation shows potential promise. Now it's a complex landscape, but the point I wanna to make to come to the Dominican Republican, the Dominican Republic colleagues uh, point is that, you know, we need to think in uh, more multifaceted ways of uh, international economic cooperation. And it's not only in terms of the multidisciplinarity of it, but it, it's, it's also in the way that we deal with countries at different levels of capacity. And there's, there's a potential opportunity for these agreements to pioneer a trail, not only in the former dimension, but also in this latter dimension about adapting and, and, and getting adherence and in, involvement in these by countries that have much more limited legal and regulatory uh, capacity, uh, norms and capacity. And by that, you know, the WTO found a way out of its longstanding box of not being able to get major agreements a few years ago by constructing a different approach on in its uh, trade facilitation agreement, which basically allowed for levels of commitment to be a function of how much capacity and development assistance will support that capacity existed in the system for that country. So it was not a one size fit all fits all type of approach to things. And it deliberately envisioned and tried to encourage uh, not only setting a norm, but also in investing in capacity in countries so that there can be a shared uh, uh, participation in the development of those norms, but also in implementing them. And I would submit that you know we have some we have some practitioners in the room on these agreements that this is a potentially additional facet uh, that would be very useful for many countries in the world. That are you know not necessarily the leaders in uh, in the platform economy, but that have obviously a growing economic stake in the outcome of these uh, issues. Thanks. All right, 
Thanks, Rick. And I think the fact that, uh, as we've noted, Costa Rica and Peru are both trying to join DEPA indicates that there are, there's a belief among some that these mechanisms can be useful in this regard. Does, do any of the panelists have a response to the other aspects of the questions that have been asked so far that we haven't picked up on? Or can I go, should I go around and get some new questions? Do you want, do you want to come back on something, Ellie? Sure, go ahead. We've got like 10 minutes left, or seven minutes left, something hour. Yeah, just speak. All right. Uh, well, I never thought I would say something in favor of the old system, but there was there was a kind of a certain um, built in the need to make sacrifices in the old arrangement. If you wanted to get your way in IT, say, you had to give something up in potatoes, say. And now you kind of make it sectoral, and within the sector, you kind of can drop, uh, pick and choose whatever you want to, and you make exceptions, et cetera. So what's the incentive to make sacrifices in, anymore, and what's the political cover that you can tell the potato farmers, I'm sorry, but we just had to do something for the better good of the country with IT. That, that cover doesn't exist anymore. So, so isn't that really just kind of therefore going to become every, uh, every country, every deal, everything for itself? And, uh, because, because you can pick and choose. It's like a smorgasbord. Thanks, Ali. The, the digital-only orientation is regarded by many people as a blessing, but you're saying it has its downside, which of course we recognize. On the one hand, we don't want to see internet openness traded off for bananas, and on the other hand, bananas may give incentives to parties to negotiate that might not otherwise. Um, let, let's see if there's a couple more questions before we uh, do a last round. Desiree, go ahead, please. Do you, where's the mic on that side? Milton is the mic. Um, yes, Desiree Milosevic Evans, uh, a consultant in <laughs> policy uh, space. I would uh, like to ask uh, maybe um, our discussants here to give us a little bit of their vision of where it's all going uh, in terms of having this new digital economy agreements, especially because DEPA uh, has a lot of non-binding commitments, so therefore you could um, not necessarily sign it, but not necessarily um, do everything that's in there. And um, with that in mind, I wonder whether these agreements are more influencing regulatory space or whether regulatory space that Chris talked about is more influencing uh, DEAs. And where is that uh, convergence that is happening and how do we open trade agreements as being more multi-stakeholder in order to do uh, the protection of data rights and privacy and so on? That's a very good question. Uh, Peji. Thank you for the uh, insights. Introduce the yourself. Uh, my name is uh, Professor Xu Peixi from the Communication University of China. And uh, uh, I'm very much encouraged by the, uh, the speeches. It seems to me uh, the deeper uh, model as uh, discussed uh, previously can be really helpful to limit the internet fragmentation or reduce the fragmentation uh, for the reason that uh, it has attracted uh, countries both uh, like-minded and uh, not like-minded. That is uh, very much a dividing line mm -hmm. for th such a kind of uh, agreement. So I would like to know uh, more about the typical features or attributes of this uh, uh, deeper model, but uh, perhaps I uh, from uh, Mata, since you have talked about this. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Peja. Uh, is there maybe one more question before I spin back for the last round? Yes, please, go ahead. Could oh, The mic has disappeared. Press this over, please. Is that? Yeah. Uh, okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, I. Sorry, uh, it's not like a question, I think. Can you say who you are? Yeah, my name is Sherpa. I'm a PhD candidate at University of Melbourne. 
I do cross-border data research, but uh, from a political economy perspective and not the trade perspective, which is why my question is more like a criticism to this entire regime of international agreement. Uh, because during my research, I, I found that, you know, in the 70s and the 80s and 90s, that, you know, how um, ITU, World Bank, they kind of pushed developing nations. Uh, I mean, of course, in, 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 in support of de developed nations is that, you know, they wanted to open in this kind of state partnership so that the, the developed, I mean, the, 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 the telecom operators could enter into developing countries. And then there was a lot of criticism that, you know, which actually led to international digital divide that we saw. And that has continued for many decades. I would like to raise this kind of a concern, even if we do this at this point of time, it's going to broaden this the, the digital divide. Uh, which is why I think that, you know, Deepa, and I was thinking that, you know, do we really need these kind of agreements? Because is internet fragmented? I mean, like, is the system broken that we need to protect it? It's not, and I think I think it's 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 go it's doing the other way around. You are mm. fragmenting it because what's going to happen <laughs> is that <laughs> some of the countries, if they're going to enter into the agreement, there is going to be retaliation. Let's say by BRICS, BRICS Plus, that they're going to have their own agreement, and they will not let other members to participate in it. Uh, so, which is why I think we need to have like a an a a, a, a a bird eye view of the problem. That you know, is there even a problem to fix it? So that sort of echoes Ellie's point before about policy fragmentation. All right, so let's, uh, are there no other, I just wanna make sure, nobody else in the room wants to ask anything? Okay, because we're getting towards the end of the time slot. Um, let's just go around and, and uh, see who on the panel would like to respond to any of the last three questions, starting with Marta, who was specifically called out. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, and we I have to be concise, relatively. Yes, I will try uh, to answer uh, the, uh, the question and sort of touch on, on the others as well. Um, yes, the deeper model um, is a model that at the moment will make sure that basically countries, uh, we need to talk about substance and membership. In terms of substance, uh, it is true that this uh, agreement has some uh, rules that are very much binding and other rules that are non-binding. And therefore, the non-binding ones, those that are like more soft language, they may be a little bit more attractive to countries that do not have the capacity to be able to uh, tackle all the other issues. So this is how, for example, you can attract non-like-minded countries that they may feel a little bit more comfortable in just talking, in just cooperating, on just literally having a conversation on certain issues. Um, so this is where I see sort of the, in a way, sort of where this can, can go. And in terms of substance, what I see in, and, and, and membership as well, what I see is DIPA has some aspects that are very much similar to previous agreements, and it's on the new ones that I, I think it lays the ground for opening up the conversation with countries that may not necessarily share at the moment the same views. So in terms of uh, countries that want to accede to, to this agreement, I think these agreements, like Diaz as well, what they do is that they open up this conversation, they lay the groundwork for cooperating, which in my opinion is a little bit better than having no conversation at all. Mm -hmm. I totally understand the concerns about whether they are creating a greater digital divide, where they are uh, creating a problem, but I see them as a response to the fact that there was regulatory fragmentation from a governmental <laughs> perspective, and these at least are an attempt to try to overcome a problem of countries not talking, not addressing the issues at multilateral level. So this is an attempt to say, let's start by just having some language, something that will incentivize us to talk more. And at, a pr at the moment where I think one of the previous uh, uh, interventions was, there are geopolitical concerns that will continue, absolutely agree with that. And I think that as long as we keep co talking, that is can help, especially at the moment where we have such strong geopolitical tensions. I'm a little bit of an optimist from that perspective. I still think it is better to talk and sit at a table, even if it's just to talk about best endeavor things and cooperation, rather than not having anyone sit at that table. 
Right, thanks, Ian. And that's both of these models, the DEAs and the DPs, are indeed institutionalizing dialogue. All right, just quickly your response to the three questions. Anything in particular, Neha? Or? Um, just, I, I like the fact that we ended with an existential question. Well, sure. uh, because that's Deep. the best way to come, come full circle. Um, the, the only point I want to emphasize is that, and I think this was a common theme across many questions, is every time you build a community, a digital trade community, an internet community, any community that you're building, there are some people who get excluded because they don't share the same values or the same concerns. Uh, that's inevitable. Uh, having said that, uh, I think what I have taken from this exercise of learning about these digital economy agreements is that the fact that they create this possibility of creating a transnational legal, or, a legal order, uh, the fact that they open up avenues for multi-stakeholder cooperation, and especially for the internet community, I think it's timely for people in the internet community to sit down and spot the areas where there is actually ability to engage and what are the points of intervention that are important for governments to hear because these bodies are being set up uh, as, we, as, as these agreements are being set up. So I think instead of focusing too much uh, on, on what's not going to happen, it's possibly good, as Marta said, to think about the areas where modest, even modest engagement can bear some result on reducing fragmentation. Thank you, Neha. Anything uh, from our three online people quickly as we, as we barrel towards a conclusion? Yes, Stephanie, go ahead. Very quickly, um, just picking up on what Desiree uh, said, um, I, I think we need to re remember that in quite a number of these areas, there actually isn't already existing regulation. It's not a question of regulators from all the parties or both sides clashing over which model is best, you know, uh, it's actually a more symbiotic relationship than that or synergistic sort of relationship where um, country regulators can learn from each other as they are developing some of these regulations. I mean, we've talked about AI a few times already. As, as countries are looking to put in place ways to govern the digital economy or the internet, they can learn from the experiences of others and craft regulations, I guess, with an eye to a sort of more uh, cross-border, um, you know, sort of interoperable uh, ethos. And that's not just about economic benefit, but a lot of the sort of socio-technical benefits and impacts of the, the internet as well. So something like cybersecurity or misinformation, disinformation, you know, those are not confined within national borders. They need to have a, a sort of a global flavor to them. Um, and so I think, you know, it's really important not to look at the regulation of these areas just in a national silo, but also in a sort of a global context, which I think these agreements enable. Thanks, I'll leave Stephanie. it there. Uh, okay. Uh, we, I think we are officially over time. So let's just be real concise. Uh, Ellie, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, really, uh, Rick, uh, one thing that I have concluded listening here is that uh, my earlier proposal was a uh, reactive, there should be some kind of a data bank of uh, what exists or what will exist. I think I'm kind of now moving to the notion of proactive, which is a, mo a yardstick, a model DEA type, type arrangement that, c that one can kind of in a way look at, make recommend it to countries. Uh, and for them to justify in some ways to their own constituencies why they uh, move away from that particular model. So we end not only with existentialism, but evolution away from skepticism towards cautious possible well, maybe a value. I, I'm, I, I'm skeptic, <laughs> but it's going to happen, so it may as well kind of be based on some kind of a rational model. Good point. Uh, quickly, anything? or Okay. Just about, just about the existential point about those discussions, perhaps like expanding the gaps. Mm -hmm. But if you look at from the yes, aspect of the mechanism, perhaps it looks like it. But if you just look at the result, which is we are aiming at the policy coordination, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if not, we're going for the convergence of rules. Mm -hmm. And we are all making the same effort from the different angle to have the policy coordinated in some or the other. It's all experimental. Mm -hmm. 
but also, yes, she mentioned the right part, which is we need to keep talking because we don't even know where the gap is. That's the state of the world, so we need to talk. But mm -hmm. also, from my aspect, we also need to have the solution already start building up. Because talking, yes, we see the gap, but we also have to have this pragmatic solution there. Mm -hmm. If not, we don't have the convergence. Then that's why I think people are talking about bringing in a multi-stakeholder where people can bring the technological aspect or some other aspect. So it's solution plus talk. That is where we are going ahead. I think that's how we can put it. I think that's a great point to finish on unless there's... Okay, I think we really should stop because we are now five minutes over. I want to thank everybody. I want to especially thank the three speakers who are uh, around the world in different time zones uh, for uh, hanging in there with us and joining us. So contributions were really valuable. We really appreciate it. We thank all, everybody here for participating. And now uh, let's uh, go to the gala and uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. So thanks, everybody, and good night.